And this is our May marriage month. We, this is something that we will do from year to year. It's great that we're doing this on Mother's Day. So uh, all of you wives, you know, sharpen up the elbow for the little jabs to the husband uh, while, uh, while he's listening to what we're sharing today. But, but as we said last week, you know, please, please don't just tune out this message if you're not married. Uh, don't tune out this message if your spouse isn't with you here today. Uh, if your spouse does not serve the Lord, um, I'm, I'm telling you the principles that we're talking about mm -hmm. will not only prepare you who are single for marriage, but the principles will, uh, as, well as, as well as maximize uh, and strengthen your marriage, but these principles cross over into relationships themselves. And, and Karen will explain a little bit about that. But we are so glad to be able to have, and we'll do this from year to year, May Marriage Month. And I always want to begin each year. We will, and this year we're promoting a book, and each year we'll do this. Uh, this is I Promise by Gary Smalley. And many of the keys and points that Karen and I are talking about have come from this wonderful marriage principle book. But a lot of what we're sharing as well is coming from 30 years life. of life, of, mar of dating, and then into marriage, 27 years this summer, we celebrate as husband and wife. I love That's you. Bad. Yes. I still I like you. I, <laughs> I love her. She likes me. I guess it's true. You get to choose who you like, but you have to love everybody, right? Isn't that what the old saying is? So uh, we're going to be talking to you today. This is message number two, but I really encourage you. Uh, right now, Karen and I are meeting with three uh, couples who are getting married this summer. And one thing we say to post-marrieds as well as pre-marrieds is once a year, you should take some time to invest in your marriage either by going to a conference, a marriage conference, which that's what we're doing here the month of May, uh, or getting a book, reading through a book together, uh, because just like your physical bodies need nutrition, right, your marriage needs a diet of nutrition and healthy stuff too, right? Tell and us, a good, good word us. picture for the men is you would never neglect your car for a year. Right not put oil in it like I did last year for an entire year. <clears throat> we take good care of our cars because we want them to run, so we got to take good care of our marriages. That's right. So <laughs> Dr. Gary Smalley, I promise, get it, read it. It's a very inexpensive book. You can get it through CBD, Christian Book Distributors, uh, for under $10. What a deal. Um, well, last week we talked about the role of peace in our relationships. Um, I'm not sure, I don't think we, it would be wise to have a show of hands of how many had a more peaceful week, but we are really excited knowing that the principles that we're going to be teaching you over the next few weeks uh, will really help you to not only have peace in your marriage, but like what we talked about last week is that the peace in our home, it, it spills over into every other relationship, those that you work for, those that you work with, those that you live with, those that you worship with, right. um, and having peace in our home is so imperative. And it also affects our relationship with Christ. It can strain that relationship, and then vice versa, having that strained relationship with Christ can cause us to have strained relationships with other people. Um, so last week we talked about four um, intruders into our marriage. We called them foxes uh, because we use the scripture from, from Song of Solomon where he talks about the foxes coming into the vineyard and destroying it. Uh, anybody show of hands might remember one or two, three or four. We've got a couple night, people. Man, a lot of the foxes. Yep. Uh, let's shout them out. We had assumptions, assumptions. escalation, escalation. Retreat, retreat and, and harsh, harsh language. language good job that's awesome and we know there's many foxes but those happen to be the top four and how many of you practiced not using those yeah right <laughs> <laughs> catch yourself going oh i'm assuming about him right now i need to back away right. and rethink about this right. that's the neat thing about going through uh, a course like this or just learning about these things sometimes when they're pointed out all of a sudden we become more aware and we find ourselves being very cognizant of the, maybe the bad behaviors that we've let slip by or, or just let happen over time. Mm -hmm. So those four foxes are four intruders in our marriage. But then we talked about having three keys that will secure your marriage. And do, do we have anybody remember those? I see a couple notebook papers. Shout, Shout it out. Right out. Safety. 
Safety, safety honor, and commitment. And commitment. That's right. Yeah, good stuff. Yeah, it's good. And awesome. this week? Uh, this morning we're going to talk to you <clears throat> about the box. Everybody, everybody put your fingers like this and make a box. Everybody make a box. This is the box of expectation. Mm. Every single one of us comes into a marriage relationship with expectations. Uh, our expectations and our ideas and our ideals about marriage come from, from very varied sources. I already said to you today, and probably one of the worst places we can get our ideas about marriage from uh, would be Hollywood. Mm -hmm. But Hollywood does influence yes, does. our ideas about relationships and especially roles. It comes to the role of the man, the husband, the role of the woman, the wife in the home. Unfortunately, Hollywood uh, takes our children, come on now, I'm preaching, from a very, very young age and begins to develop their ideas, which are perverted, by the way, and not biblical, as to what the roles and relationship is so of the true. husband and the wife in a home. So Hollywood influences us. Your parents, how you were raised. Mm -hmm. You watched your mom and dad during the good time, and you watched your mom and da your your mom and dad during the difficult times. You watched how you know they they communicated during the good times, and you watched how they communicated during the difficult times. And so we watch our parents. If you come from a single parent home. There's an influence. There's a, a completely whole new dynamic if you come right. from a single parent home. Dad predominantly raised you. Uh, mom left the home or dad left the home and mom raised you. So again, there's another whole uh, system of ideas and, and dynamic of ideas that we place into our box. Our, our friends. We go over to our friend's home and we see how our friend's parents interact. And so from just a young age, we have all of these influencers in our lives. And so we all come into our marriages with this box of expectation. And can I tell you, in the culture, I probably couldn't have said this 50 years ago. Maybe I probably could have, but it's so more real more real to say today in the 21st century that unfortunately this box of expectation is doing more harm in our marriages mm. than it yes, is it good is. so what do we need because our idea of marriage is askew we have got to get the moral compass of the Bible out and we have got to use the Bible and make that our culture and our idea of what a marriage relationship should be. And I'll throw this in before Karen goes to her next part. We really feel many, many times when we talk with people one-on-one -on -one or when we talk with couples, those that are struggling with their relationship with Christ, more times than not, are struggling in their relationship with their spouse. Yeah. As she said, also the other way. Oftentimes, we struggle with our relationship with our spouse because we are struggling with our relationship with Christ. Isn't it something? The horizontal and the vertical all work together. Mm -hmm. And when you put these together like this, right? Well, I don't know if I can do two things at one time. When you put these things, try that. This is really like kind of... Yeah, this is, this is real. When you put these together, you have the cross. <laughs> and on the cross, Jesus died. Can I tell you, to have a happy marriage, there's a side of us that has to die. Mm -hmm. Our expectations in that box have to be compromised from what we may have seen to biblical standard. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, one thing that I, I want to talk a little bit more about expectations uh, because some of our boxes are packed full of expectations. Yeah. Whether or not we want to admit it, we really do. Um, but we need to replace and just change our vocabulary. And instead of having expectations, we need to have desires. And maybe some of you will say, oh, that's just a play on the words. Mm -hmm. But an expectation is a bar that somebody sets on you, usually unspoken, and therefore you will either always fall short or just rebel against it if it is spoken. Because right. expectations that are given to you, we just struggle with that when it comes to a, a marriage relationship or any close intimate relationship. That's right. Okay, so but if you change that, 
that word into desires instead of I expect you to do this for me or I expect you to not do this because of me but say I really desire this um, it actually changes everything and what it is is our motivation has been changed yes and so um, I want another thing I wanted to share is that God desires our love and God desires to have a relationship with you you won't find anywhere in the Bible where God expects your love mm -hmm. and he doesn't expect a relationship he desires that and when he, someone that you have a relationship a good positive relationship desires something we tend to trip over our own left feet to help them yes, accomplish that if i point. know what he wants and i'm not mad at him then i'm not angry with him <laughs> we're in a good relationship then i will do that whatever it takes to make sure that i make him happy but those expectations tend to be like that bar, that, that level that we just can't, I'm just not good enough. And there's not a worse feeling than to feel like I'm not good enough. That's right. It's really um, expectations are that, what, conquer and subdue mentality. Yeah, and even God, God refused to do that. God, God did not make us puppets. That's right. That we have to do what he wants, but he allows us to choose. And so we have to be very careful for it. It's a, this is a fox I'm going back to that Song of Solomon uh, reference. It's a fox that will destroy our marriage if we have expectations on our spouse instead of desires. Right, so that, that box of expectations, that box of expectations that we're talking about, the ideas and the influence that we have that isn't from a biblical paradigm, it confuses things. Because mm -hmm. recall, and those of you getting married this summer, uh, do we have, how, I don't know how many of our couples do we have here this morning getting married. I saw... Um, mm. Zach and Aaron, why don't you guys stand? There's, huh? They're all <laughs> they're separated. What's, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> Stay standing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, mom's there you in go. the middle. Uh, Shad and Molly, are you guys up here at all? They're probably in kids' church. Shad and Molly, and uh, Jared, Jared and, and Selena. Selena. Jared and Selena, Don't are you guys here morning. today? It's uh, Jared is actually Dan and Rose. Uh, uh, Philip's grandson. All right, you guys can sit down. All right, way to go, Mom, right between them. Wow. <laughs> this is the only way they pay attention to what's <laughs> happening in here. That's right. That's funny. She's not there to distract him in a positive way. That's what I'm saying, <laughs> in a positive way. Uh, but one thing that we will share with these couples, even in their vows, is that marriage comes from God. Mm -hmm. The first marriage was instituted in the presence of God himself. So how in the world could anybody ever think they could get marriage right without God? Mm -hmm. It's absolutely impossible to get marriage right without God. Matter of fact, because even in the church world, Christianity, 50% of marriages are ending in divorce. Even in the church world, when surveyed, only one out of five surveyed marriages would say they have a truly, a truly happy marriage. Can I say to you that we have a difficult time at times in our marriage relationships as born-again believers. How in the world can people do it without God? Yeah. Have you ever wondered that just in life itself? How do people do life without God? Missy, Dirk, I have no idea. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea, this is a wonderful, great, beautiful woman sitting here. I mean, just perfect in so many ways, for me, perfect in so many ways. But I just don't know how she and I could successfully do marriage for 27 years and be able to sit here and say, we not only love each other because Jesus commanded you have to love everybody to get to heaven, <laughs> But to say that we actually like each other too. Mm -hmm. And to be able to say, at least I would be able to mm -hmm. say on a survey, which might be pushing her a little bit, that my marriage is a happy marriage. <laughs> I would be in that category of one out of five. And I do not think it would be possible, Sean Heather, without God at the center, because it really becomes difficult. So what do we do? I've got to get to my point this morning. <laughs> there is a point here today. Uh, we're going to have a couple of points for you, some things uh, for you to jot down. So the first thing you want to jot down, we have it on the PowerPoint, is that I create security in my marriage when I stop working on my mate and I start working on myself. You, know, you got that elbow all, all uh, sharpened up, ladies, because 
you know, I can say this as a man, I like to fix everything. And when my wife comes to me with situations or problems or difficulties, I like to fix things. <laughs> so I, in my marriage, have had to learn that I can create safety in our marriage when I stop trying to work on her because Amen. of my expectations and I really work on me. Galatians 6.5, isn't it amazing that the author of marriage, the creator of marriage, also gives us a lot of guidelines in his word. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 5, simply says, For we are each responsible for our own conduct. Too many people today in general, it's the culture, the society that we live in today, basically live their life working on everybody else around them. Don't look to your left. And don't look to your right. Just keep looking right straight up here at me. But too often, we as a society today make our peace, our happiness, and our fulfillment contingent on somebody else's actions. Mm -hmm. Come on. Whether it be somebody who's trying to uh, collect a debt from you and how they're trying to collect an unpaid debt from you, Mm -hmm. whether it be the service that you get at the mall, whether it be the service you get at a local restaurant, uh, in your own family units, dad and mom, uh, mom to the children, dad to the children. It seems like we're always trying to fix everybody else around us. Everybody else has the problem. Yeah. Hello. And if I could just fix everybody, if everybody else around me could just get their act together. Then life would be good. Life would be good. That's not the way it works. Mm-hmm. Matthew 7, I don't think we have this on the PowerPoint because we read it to you last Sunday from the message. Let me just read this to you one more time. Don't take on people, jump on their failures, and criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment. And around and around the marriage goes. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face. And be completely oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. That's number one. Number two. Number two is I create security when I start working on my heart. Um, Some of you came here today. um, Maybe you, on your way to church, got into a little disagreement. And you're pretty convinced that your mate is the problem. You believe that they are the source of all of your conflict. But the Bible says that we need to start with our own heart. My heart determines my actions. And the Bible talks, there's several, um, I believe they're up on PowerPoint. I'm just going to read them, uh, not too quickly. Uh, Proverbs 4, 23 says, Above all, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Matthew 12, 34, For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Proverbs 27, 19, As water reflects a face, so a man's heart reflects the man. Proverbs 23, verse 7, for as, a man, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. And then in Matthew 15, verses 19 and 20, Don't you understand, Jesus asked him, anything you eat passes through the stomach, then goes out of the body. But evil words, evil thoughts, evil actions, evil reactions come from an evil heart and defile the person who says them. From... For from the heart comes evil and slander. These are what defile you. Eating with unwashed hands could never defile you and make you unacceptable to God. So first we have to understand that God is really passionate about our marriages. Many times we put God on the back burner when it comes to our marriage. Right. And we just think, well, you know, he's the problem. I'm the problem. It's, it's, it's my finances that are a problem. But God is passionate and saying, no, no, no. I am the source of your solutions It doesn't matter what the problems are around us. God is the source of our solutions. And a primary reason for an unhappy marriage is spiritual depravity and deficiency. So how do we change what's inside of our heart? Not easy. By recognizing what triggers us. Right. What are our buttons? Well, we're going to get a little transparent right here, right now. (laughs) I'm sure none of you have buttons. We have some buttons. We have some buttons. So there's a little uh, PowerPoint that's up behind us right now, behind Karen and I. You should be able to see it. And um, 
Uh, keep going. One more. Uh, sure, there we go. So this kind of explains what a typical, or identifies, reveals what a typical, some people like to call it heavy fellowship. We call it argument. Argument. <laughs> Intense fellowship. <laughs> uh, this is kind of what an argument looks like in the Shorey home with Darren and Karen. Uh, it's quite easy to see, isn't it? Uh, there could have been a lot more points in here, but I have hot buttons. Well, you do too, so stop looking at me like that. <laughs> I have hot buttons, and when my buttons are pushed, mm -hmm. there's usually similar reactions that, that, that result of pushing that button. Mm -hmm. Somewhere in that reaction involves me wanting to push her buttons, and I almost can't control myself at times. It's like, I mean, look, I have the Word of God in me. Uh, we're doing a, you know, May, this is May marriage month, so we have to really be careful this month because the enemy's really <laughs> trying to throw the right hook at us because, so you know, true. we're here trying to help many of you, and in our effort to do so, the enemy's kind of, you know, pig piling on top of us, so we have to really, you know, heat up intensify the prayer and, and devotion life or else this could be a complete flop not only here <laughs> in the church but also for us as, as a couple but but I just get this intense desire to want to push her buttons and what happens when I push her buttons she reacts and she pushes more of my buttons and as you can see this just continues mm -hmm. to go around and around and around mm -hmm. this is the first time that I'm going to give you permission for you to raise your hands right now if any of your arguments ever look like this <laughs> This side seems to have more peace, apparently. Yeah, more peace. <laughs> there were very few hands. Or they're going to come to the altar quickly for lying after service. That's what. <laughs> so you have to know what your spouse's hot buttons are. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, I bet if we passed a list around, a piece of paper, I guarantee that you all could write two or three on the male side, one page, the women on the other. Right, for their husbands. We could all, mm -hmm. I think, very quickly identify each other's hot buttons. We know what they are. Uh, as a couple, it's great for you to talk about these, mm -hmm. really, openly. Uh, for me, I'll just give you what mine are. Uh, for me, I have, I have hot buttons. Uh, I don't like to be controlled. I don't like to be judged. And I don't like to feel like a failure. There are probably a few times in the course of the year, you know, when, you know, my wife and I are disagreeing heavily <laughs> and I will say you know some of what you're saying and she might not she might not mean it on purpose but some of what you're saying is making me feel like a failure you know in some area of my life and so when I help her to recognize that it gives her an opportunity to just maybe re restate things and the same for me because she has hot buttons that she's going to identify at this very moment I, yeah, I have, I, I think my list might have been longer, but he told me to narrow yeah, it down three. to three, so. Um, I don't like my self-esteem to be threatened. That's Saints, a big one. You have to say that again. I so, don't like my self-esteem to be threatened. Self-esteem to be threatened. I don't like to feel unvalued, yeah. and I don't like to feel disconnected or rejected. And do I ever do or make you feel like any of those three? You can be honest. <laughs> <laughs> wow, we're really transparent. Yes. yes. Um, but I would say, yeah. though, it really takes a discipline because when he pushes my button, it, it's not always knowingly that we push. It's, it's how we say something. And if I don't say, hey, that made me feel like blank, then I am going to actually turn right around and push his button. That's right, right. And so this, it really takes uh, a self-discipline to stop because I don't want to be on that circle train. That's a hard one to get off very difficult and usually there's so much damage afterwards that it takes a very long time to repair that trust and so I think it's really important for us to learn how to communicate which for some is really strange and maybe feels a little weird to say well what you just said made me feel like blank but when we do that it gives that other person and the opportunity to say oh, oh I didn't mean it like that and they can rephrase or, it. Or I did mean, and I better go repent. And then I'll go push three buttons. Yes. <laughs> uh, but it's in our home. It's uh, it, it is really interesting. Um, it's interesting how we also like to fit scripture in. And uh, I'm, I'm sure that none of you are going to use what you've learned 
um, over the next few weeks and last week. And, Please don't. Um, you know, that's, that's Remember not... Remember what Pastor said, right? And Lori pulls out her notebook. <laughs> Remember what he said. <clears throat> but not to use things against people, but yeah. to really have a prayerful heart. And it really takes, going back again to last week's message, where we talked about having a humble Safety. heart yeah, humble to heart. create that safety. You have to be willing to go, okay, God, examine me. That's right. We want to tie this up this morning. So that first point, in case you're writing, that first point of the second point uh, was my heart determines my actions. So those hot buttons, those sometimes determine my actions. So mm -hmm. I've, I've got to work on those, but working on that means communicating with my spouse uh, to help work on those, to work on my heart. Uh, so the second part of this is that simply my heart needs to be examined. And listen, guys, this is where God comes in. And this is where I say, I don't know how married couples without God mm -hmm. do it. This is where God comes in. Because the Bible says in Psalm 139, 23, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my, my anxious, anxious thoughts. thoughts. This is powerful. Do you know the Bible teaches us that no man really knows the heart? Does it not? Mm -hmm. That the heart is actually, come on, King James Version, <laughs> quote it with me, is deceptive, deceptive deceitfully, mm -hmm. wicked, and, and no, no man, man can knows know it. it. No mm -hmm. man can know it. This is where we need God. You know, we're, we're not little Jesus juniors running around down here. And, you know, those of you getting married this summer, you know, Lord forbid that any of you pre-married couples, you know, make your, your, uh, make your um, uh, soon-to-be husband or wife, you know, feel like you're perfect because you're not perfect. You're not perfect. We're not perfect. We're all wired differently. God wired us intentionally. Mm -hmm. And for us to really align to any type of perfection, it's the perfection that He is doing in our hearts. Because only He knows our heart. And along the way, He allows me to discover some little things about my heart. And here's the neat thing. When my heart is out of alignment, it usually shows up in my marriage. Mm -hmm. When my heart is out of alignment, it usually shows up in my spiritual walk. So if I'm going to get this right, and I'm going to get this right, then I have got to go to the cross, to God, the one who truly knows my heart, and have him help me uh, to understand my heart. Uh, the last thing Karen will share is that here's the good news, good news, yeah. that my heart can change. All of these buttons are just a result of the sin, the fall. God's word says, I have hidden my heart that, I've hidden his word in my heart that I may not sin against him, Psalm 119, verse 11. Um, we are all conditioned in life. Yes. Every person here is conditioned mm -hmm. by how we were raised, kind of like what you were mentioning earlier, our parental influence, leaders that were around us, the culture, if you were raised by a TV, and many people, that's baby, the TV babysat, so the TV was teaching those children, yeah. and we are influenced by everything around us, and that conditions us, but the exciting thing is, is we can all change, and it's never too late to change. Well, maybe you say, well, I've been married 47 years, I don't think you're going to change me now. Well, you know what? I can't. But I know that God can. And when we're willing to say, okay, God, search my heart. Help me. You know, when I see that he is having a rough day and he's acting in a way that's not normal to him, I can easily respond to that and begin pushing those buttons back. Or I can get on my knees and say, God, there's something going on. I need you to cover him in prayer. And it is amazing what happens when I humble myself and not react the way I feel like I should or I'm entitled or I deserve to react. But instead, I pull myself back and say, God, I need your help. Mm. We have to replace everything that is inside of our heart with what God wants to give us. We need to clean out the junk. I want to read these few things with you. I'm not sure if it's on the PowerPoint, but these are powerful. God wants to replace the pain of your yesterdays with his promises. He wants to replace the guilt and the shame with his acceptance and his grace. He wants to replace horrific memories with peace. He wants to replace the neglect and abuse with forgiveness. He wants to replace a heartbreaking divorce with love and restoration. Amen. He wants to replace the betrayal and bitterness with his faithfulness and his trustworthiness. 
and he wants to replace the perversion, the poverty, and the pride with his power to restore, revive, and renew. Can we all stand together this morning? Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and basically when you say that, you're confessing that he is the boss of your life and not you. You're not the boss of your life. And when you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We know this scripture very well. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by confessing with your mouth that you are saved. Mm -hmm. I often say this in settings just like this, as well as in our pre-marriage coaching and counseling, that every husband really deserves a praying wife, Mm -hmm. and every wife deserves a praying husband. We can't wait for next week. Do you know what we're going to talk about next Sunday? You have no idea, do you? (laughs) We're going to talk about that scripture that tells us, wives. It's going to be a good one. (laughs) Submit yourselves to your own husbands. And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church. Oh, you can't wait now. I've seen somebody say, you're coming to this one. (laughs) The men are going to be dragging the women. (laughs) But you know, this morning, we're just going to ask uh, if you would, when the music begins, we did this last Sunday. This is how we'll close today. I'm going to ask all the married couples in just a moment to come all across this front. And, you know, we, we noticed this last week. Some of you, Kim, you know, Joe's on security. If your husband is doing ministry somewhere or if your spouse isn't with you today, why don't you come as well?